All right. Verse 17, he says, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. What has God distributed to every man? Well, in verse 7, he said, I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Meaning, some men, God just hasn't made it possible for them to stay single. Some men have been given the gift of being able to be single. Some men have been distributed the gift of having a wife. And whatever you were called in, it said right there, as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. If you got saved and you're single, stay single. If you got saved being married, stay married. Abide in the same calling wherein you were called. He said, and so ordain I in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Now, circumcision right there, he's going to define it for you here in a minute. Is any man called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but what is it? What circumcision he's describing right here? The keeping of the commandments of God. He's talking about keeping, I believe, the law. Romans 2.25. If he's talking about physical circumcision there, I don't understand how in the world a person could be circumcised when they get saved and then become uncircumcised. doesn't work. You can't reattach the, the flesh of the foreskin, and just like when you get saved, you're never going to have your flesh reattached to your soul. A man can't physically become uncircumcised. So what's he talking about? Circumcision, in verse uh, Romans 2.25, he says, For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Now, I think this passage, because I'm not 100% sure, I've been studying it out for a long time, and I'm not 100% sure, but when he says, is any man called being circumcised? I believe he's saying, is any man called keeping the law? Like Paul, when he was keeping the law and got saved? A lot of people ask, well, if Paul got saved, why did he keep returning to Jerusalem every year for the Passover? Why did he keep taking vows? And why did he choose to keep himself under the law? Well, I believe there are several reasons, but one of them is he got saved under the law, and I believe he chose to stay under the law because that's where God called him. It says circumcision here is the keeping of the commandments of God. And it clearly says in Romans 2.25, if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Meaning, if you break the law after keeping it, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. That's how I believe you can be called being circumcised and then choose to become uncircumcised. And that would not be right to do. You should stay in the same calling wherein you were called. Uh, Galatians 5. Verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you get saved and you're uncircumcised, and you choose, you know what, I'm going to be circumcised. And you know what circumcision is? It's a covenant and a promise. It's a sign and a token that you're going to keep the law. That's what God gave Abraham there in uh, Genesis, I believe it was 17. And if you get circumcised, Christ is going to profit you nothing. You say, why? Because you're vowing to be a keeper of the law. I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And then verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. It does not matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're keeping the law or not keeping the law. That's not what Jesus Christ is about. But in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is letting you know, and I don't believe this applies to anybody in here. Did anybody in here keep the Old Testament law before you got saved? 
All right, me neither. So this is talking, I believe, about Jews back then who were under the law, still practicing it when they heard about Christ the first time, just like Paul, doing it ignorantly and unbelief. Verse 20, he says, Let a man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? That's like a slave. Care not for it. But if thou be, mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. That means if you're a slave and you get saved, that doesn't mean you're automatically freed from your master. You stay a slave and you serve the Lord in that role as a slave. That is something that the United States of America did not preach well. Pastors did not maintain that standard, especially the northern pastors who took up the abolitionist cause. And they told a bunch of slaves to rebel. And all the slaves that were Christians who rebelled lost rewards, disobeyed God, dishonored the Lord because they didn't follow this scripture. If you get saved and you're a servant, don't care for it. And if you can be made free, use it, rather, it says. If your master offers for you to be freed, don't accept it and use that position of slavery as an opportunity to earn rewards in subjection. 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. There is not a single slave who has ever lived who is saved, who is not free. When you trust in Jesus Christ, if you're a slave, you are the freest person on the earth. Even with chains bound around your ankles and separated from your wife and kids by your cruel master, you are the freest man on earth if you are in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. You're the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is, the Lord, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. That's clear. In Galatians 1, he said, If I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you're a slave, be a servant to Christ. If you're not a slave, you're a servant to Christ. Either way, slave or not slave, servant or unservant, circumcised or uncircumcised, Everything is about serving Jesus Christ now. Don't try to change your physical situation once you're in Christ. Abide in that calling. Verse 23, he said, Ye are bought with a price. What was that price? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 28, which he purchased with his own blood. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called... Therein abide with God. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. He is speaking to slaves here in Colossians 3, 23, servants. <clears throat> and he says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Meaning, when your master tells you to go plow in the field, or when your master tells you you've got to go and walk across the desert, you do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Once you get saved, it doesn't matter if you're a slave or not. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is where you can earn your reward in heaven. And do not try to flee from being a servant, because being a good and faithful servant unto the Lord as a slave on the earth is how you could earn good rewards. Be not ye the servants of men, he says. Verse 24, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. And he's going to apply that. He's already applied it to circumcision versus uncircumcision. If you're under the law when you get saved, stay under the law like Paul did. If you're not under the law when you get saved, don't put yourself under the law. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. If you are married... When you get saved, stay married to that person. If you're single when you get saved, stay single. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. Wherever you got saved, whatever your situation or station was, stay there. Is God's counsel to you. Verse 25. Now, concerning virgins. Virgins in the Bible... Outside of this chapter, this chapter has a unique use of the word. Every other time in the Bible, a virgin is a reference to a young man or woman who has never had sex. A young man or woman who has never been with someone else. 
So right here it says, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So if you're a young person and you've never been married, here's Paul's counsel. Verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. It is good for a man, so these virgins he's talking about, concerning virgins, it is good for a man so to be. Meaning, if you are a young man or a young woman, you are specifically right here he says men. Uh, it is good for a man so to be. Be what? A virgin. If you can handle it, if God has given you the ability and you're young and you're unmarried, stay unmarried. That's Paul's counsel. It's not a command from the Lord Jesus Christ that you should never get married. It's just Paul's advice. If you can do it, it's good, so to be. Why? Verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? All right, so there's his counsel for virgins, and he'll tell you the reason here in a minute. Here's his counsel for a married person. If you're a virgin, stay a virgin. If you're married, art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. But what if she's lost? Seek not to be loosed. What if she's saved, but she's a hag? <laughs> Seek not to be loosed. What, if, what about women? Art thou loosed from a wife? <coughs> Seek not a wife. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he's called. I, if you are loosed from a wife, if you get saved and you've already been divorced, say, what should I do? Paul's advice, this is not a command from the Lord, but his advice is stay unmarried. It'll be better for you. It's good. Just like it's good for a young man to remain a virgin, it's good for you to stay married if you got married. It's good for you to stay unmarried if you were unmarried. Verse 28, he says, But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. See that? He's not telling you, black and white, never get married. If you got saved and you're divorced, never get married again. He says, But, if, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. If you were unmarried when you got saved and you choose to get married, it's not a sin against God. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. It's not a sin for a young lady to get married. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Now this right here, this is very unique. I believe, just like I showed you last week from Timothy, I believe it's a young woman's, or it's the will of Paul for a young woman to get married. Virgins right here, very strange, does not just apply to young women. Virgins applies also to a woman who was married and is now unmarried. In verse 32, it says, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Verse 34. Let's figure out what a virgin is according to this passage. A female virgin. Verse 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. You see the two categories here? There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman. Which one do you think that is? Paul's definition in 1 Corinthians 7 of a virgin is an unmarried woman. Careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married, that's a wife, obviously. Careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So if he tells you that a virgin is an unmarried woman, well, back in verse 11, he said, But and if she depart, that's a saved woman who departs from her husband. God says, Let her remain unmarried. In this passage, a virgin can mean a woman who has been divorced. She has had sex. She has had a husband before but she is now unmarried. She can be called a virgin in this passage just by the plain definitions of the words that Paul uses. And that helps us understand a strange passage there at the end of 1 Corinthians 7. So keep that in mind. A virgin in this passage is not just a young lady who has never had sex. 
It can be a woman who is no longer married. Verse 28 is where we were. If a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. So he's not talking about just young ladies. If you get married, you're going to have trouble. No, I believe he's talking about these unmarried women who used to have a husband. And you're allowed to get married again, but expect trouble in the flesh. And Paul says, but I spare you. It's better in the Lord to be single. Do it if you can. Next, he says, but this I say, brethren... The time is short. Romans 13, 11, and 12. The time is short. What's he talking about? The time is short. You don't have much time left. Romans 13, 12, Paul says, The night is far spent. Well, verse 11. That knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Back in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29, he says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both, oh, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. What the world is he talking about? I'll show you in a minute. But Paul is saying the time is short. Jesus Christ is coming back very soon, and our earthly physical relationships are not going to be the same. Jesus told us, you're not married and given in marriage in heaven. You're as the angels of God in the resurrection, uh, which is what we have to look forward to. And it says, <clears throat> they that have wives be as though they had none, verse 30, and they that weep as though they wept not. You say, why? Because God's going to wipe away every tear. They that rejoice as though they rejoiced not. And they that buy as though they possess not. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. Paul is saying the end of the world is coming. The time remaineth and uh, the time is short. Verse 31. And they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. So what is he talking about? The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The world's going to be destroyed. The end is coming soon. So Paul, why are you saying that? What are you trying to tell us? Verse 32, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord. He's saying, listen, guys, marriage is fine if you want to get married. But I'm going to let you know, if you're unmarried, stay unmarried if you can. You say, why? Because if you get married, you are going to care for the things of the world. And we've got about this much time left until the Lord comes back. And it'd be better if you could spend all that time, 100% of the time, caring about and worrying about the things of the Lord, serving the Lord day in and day out, spending time studying the scripture, trying to lead people to the Lord, because there is short time left until the world is destroyed. And I would have you without carefulness. You say, what is he talking about carefulness? He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth. That's what he's saying when he says, I would have you without carefulness. He's meaning, I don't want you to get married and have to care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, if you've read the whole rest of the passage, you know it's not wrong to be married. God is pleased with a marriage. Marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. But he's saying, if there's very little time left in this earth, and you've got a choice between caring for a wife and caring for the Lord, and you're not married, don't go and chase a wife so that you can spend the rest of your days not earning rewards in heaven 24-7. Spend the time you've got trying to please the Lord. I would have you without carefulness. Verse 34, he says, There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. That's what we've got up on the board here. The unmarried woman, that's the virgin, careth for the things that belong to the Lord. That's not what it says. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. 
That's what he's talking about right here. I would have you without carefulness. Don't get married if you're unmarried. Why? So you can attend upon the Lord continually without distraction. It says over there in Timothy, when it's uh, 1 Timothy 5, describing a widow indeed. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God, praying and fasting night and day. Her whole <coughs> life, waking and sleeping, is about trying to please the Lord. That's a widow indeed, according to 1 Timothy 5. And Paul is saying, if you're not married, I know I've repeated about 10 times, but that's because Paul keeps repeating it. Give yourself wholly to the Lord without distraction. Don't go chasing a wife. If you can manage and you don't have to commit fornication, don't be married. But you know what? It is better to marry than to burn. If you're just going to commit fornication while you're trying to please the Lord, you're going to burn at the judgment seat by, because of all your fornication. Get married if that's what you need. He said, in the middle of verse 35 there, he said, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. That word comely there, it's what's becoming. It's what's fitting and proper, the way a Christian ought to act. Verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin. Say, what's a virgin? Most people teach that this is talking about a man dealing with his virgin daughter. I don't believe that one bit. I believe that this passage is talking about a man who has a woman who departed from him, or he put her away, and it says, if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin. Say, what do you mean? You're teetering on fornication. You've got this woman that you want to have a sexual relationship with. If you behave uncomely toward her, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, your body requires this need, it says, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. He sinneth not. I believe this is a couple which is separated that is reconciling. And the virgin there is an unmarried woman in verse 34. And right there it said, he sinneth not. Notice in verse 28 it says, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. That's connecting you right there with you're a person who got, who was married, now you're unmarried. It's not a sin to remarry. I believe he's bringing that same subject back up here in verse 36. Let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. Say, who's them? The man and his virgin. The unmarried woman that he separated from. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity. Say, what's the necessity? A need to have sex. Requirement in verse 36. It says, he needs so require. Verse 37, having no necessity. Meaning you can... Well, what it says right there. But hath power over his own will. There are some men who just, you don't have the willpower to overcome fornication. Maybe there's a woman in your life, like this right here. Maybe you got divorced, and you know what? You miss that woman. You want to be back with her. She's going to church with you, whatever. You're in each other's lives. What? We're unmarried. Should we stay unmarried? He says, yeah, it's better if you can stay unmarried. But if you can't help yourself and if your will and your body is requiring that necessity of coming together you haven't sinned if you come together do it it's better than fornicating and that right there shows you that just flesh joining flesh is not a marriage in god's sight if you got divorced you better have a intent to remain married after that if you're going to come back together again you shouldn't just come together and then separate and then come together and separate marriage is more than just coming together in a physical union it has to do with an intent to be married, to be committed one to another, to be husband and wife. Verse 37, he said, But hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin. Doeth well. You say, what in the world does that mean, keep his virgin? Stay away from having sex with a woman he's unmarried from, that departed from him or that he put away. If you do that, you doeth well. Verse 38, so then... He that giveth her in marriage doeth well. If you get married to her, that's fine. But he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. That's Romans 7, 2, and 3. Romans 7, 2, and 3. That right there again, why in the world would he say that unless he was talking about a woman who was separated from her husband and he's still alive? The wife is bound by the law to her husband 
as long as he liveth. Romans 7, 2 and 3. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Even if she departs, even if he puts her away, she is bound by the law to that man. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. In that passage, it's telling you that you are loosed from the law of your flesh because you're dead to the law. So you can be married to Christ. I believe it also means two other things. If you are a saved woman, you are bound by the law to your husband as long as that man is alive. But if that man dies, that saved man dies, I believe you're free to remarry because you're not bound anymore. It's better if you can stay single, like all of 1 Corinthians 7 says, but if you can't help it, you can remarry, you haven't sinned, but you'll have trouble in the flesh. What else does it mean? I believe it helps with this understanding. If you are a saved woman married to a lost man, that man is not alive in God's sight. He is dead in trespasses and sins. Is that right? If her husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. That's why I believe it's fine if a Christian woman has a lost husband who leaves her, she's fine to remarry even if that man's still alive. You say, why? Because he's dead, spiritually, dead in trespasses and sins, and she's loosed from the law of that man. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 7, a brother or sister is not under bondage. They're not bound by the law in such cases. <clears throat> Verse 39, 1 Corinthians 7. The wife is bound by the law to her husband as uh, bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. You know what that means? Woman, if you're going to get remarried, don't marry a lost guy. Amen? Amen? Only in the Lord means only get married to somebody who's in the Lord. Don't get married to somebody without the Lord. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But she is happier if she so abide. Abide how? As a virgin or as a widow. She's happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 7, I mean, I feel like I just read the uh, code of law for North Carolina traffic court. I mean, it goes all over the place, and it reminds you a thousand times, but I believe it's very clear. Marriage is not wrong. And he gives you some very clear rules on, hey, you can be married, you can be unmarried. There's no black and white, every man should be married, or every man should stay single. It's different case by case. It depends on whether the Lord has given you that ability to stay single. If you get unmarried... If your spouse leaves you or if you separate from your spouse, there are rules about these things, but there is no hard and fast, never get married again. No, it says, but if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. See, he's given you some liberty here when it comes to marriage, but don't forget the big picture. What's the big picture? Marriage is given by God to help you avoid fornication. That's what's in Paul's mind the whole time here is, look, if you can... If you can manage to stay unmarried and not fornicate, do it. But marriage is there as a way to keep you from fornication. You see that? It's very clear in 1 Corinthians 7. He doesn't just randomly take a detour off of the judgment seat of Christ and off of fornication just to tell you about marriage because marriage is so special. He's letting you know marriage is a tool from God to protect you from fornication, which is the will of God. You ought to study a chapter like 1 Corinthians 7 and learn it and know it. Because God's will is that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in any dishonor to the defiling of the flesh. Or, uh, I think I just misquoted a verse, but... Fornication, it will destroy you. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. You will burn at the judgment seat of Christ for fornication. Do not get caught up in it. It will destroy you. Every sin that a man committeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It's a big deal. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. In this passage, we heard about old men and women who passed the flower of their age, yet still needed sexual relationship to be satisfied. God knows. You don't have to hide in a closet with your issues like that. Go to God. Figure out what he says for you to do. Don't just give in to the will of your flesh. And... Uh, you know, follow the counsel of Paul. I trust you. It's better counsel than you're going to get from any Christian counselor on this planet. Follow Paul's counsel. Any questions at all about that?
I know that's a lot of ground to cover. Any questions? Important stuff. All right. Thank you, Lord. Hope you learned. Wednesday night we'll be in the no, nursing home, right? No, regular service. That's next week. Next week. On the 10th. Okay. All right. Regular service this Wednesday. Thanks for listening so well. Let's pray, and we'll get out of here. Brother Matthew, do you mind closing us in prayer?